My name is Simon Brown. So this evening we're looking at starting a present portfolio from scratch. Now I want to step back and say what am I talking about in terms of portfolio? And I drove delve into ETS costs. How to do it as well? One of the things is, you know, if you've got five million rand, starting a portfolio is easy. If you've got five hundred rand, it's a little more challenging. So how do we how do we build a portfolio? But also how do we do it with smaller amounts? And obviously how do we do it with larger amounts worth touching on as well? But let's start off by first what I mean by portfolio. What I'm talking about is a mature, long-term portfolio. When I say long-term, I'm measuring it in decades. I'm not worried when markets collapse. I just carry on holding the stocks that I like. If I look at the crisis of 2008, 2009, a whole lot of stocks went incredibly pear-shaped, and the stocks that were in my long-term portfolios, I continued to hold them. And there's two key parts, the ETFs, I just hold because I plan to die owning those. The individual stocks, I hold as long as they remain quality companies. The ShopRite share price will go up and down. If you go to crazy 220, it might go back to 100. I don't really mind in particular because I'm not focusing on the short term. I'm not trading this portfolio. It is a long term, what I call a sort of fire and forget type portfolio. You put serious quality into it and you somewhat just leave it. There are other ways you can do markets. You can go into the short-term trading space. You can go into the much more highly speculative space. I'll touch on some of the speculative, the small and mid caps. But again, in that space, I still want proven winners. Someone said to me on Twitter this afternoon, uh, "Would I is, pre is prescient the next uh, coronation? Maybe, maybe. Would I be buying it? No, prove it first. Because yes, the share price, by the time they've proved that the share price has probably gone from one rand to five rand, that's fine, I'll buy it at five rand, because the next coronation, it's going to 100. I did it with Colgro. At 50 cents, I didn't like Colgro. They were on the brink of bankruptcy. They got their act together, they proved it, they started to make money, stock got to three rand, I bought it. Everyone's like, but it's already up sixfold. That's fine, it's proved it to me. I want to buy the winners. I want to buy those that have proved it to me. I don't want to buy a speculative. Speculator, uh, you know, can you do that virus strategy? Sure you can. There's the, the one in 10 bagger theory. You go and buy 10 dogs and you hope that one of them goes up tenfold, nine of them go bankrupt, and you have made break even. So you actually need one of them to go up 20-fold to make money. Is that a strategy? Sure, you can do it. It's not what I'm talking about this evening. I'm talking about boring, proven stocks. So next delve in. Long term, definitely decades. We're talking capital appreciation. We're talking about beating the index. If we don't beat the index, we stop trying. And we sort of buy the index. We buy it with an exchange traded fund. Beating the index means we're going to get negative years because sometimes the index goes down. In 2008, the index was down 25%. If you were down 15%, tech, that's my phone. Well, that's deeply unfortunate. <laughs> and I can't turn it off because that's my internet access, so I promise I won't answer it. The point of beating the index is that, yes, so you might be down 15% when the market is down 25, but it's beating, it's outperforming that index more times than not. Sometimes the index will beat you, but as long as you're beating it more times than not, that's what's critically important. It's been very aware of costs. Costs are absolutely critical. There's an article on finweek.com today, uh, and I forget the exact numbers, but something like if you've got a long-term retirement annuity, and I think it's a 40-year retirement annuity, a 1% decrease in costs adds 30% to your ultimate value. Now, the numbers sounded completely and absolutely obscenely wrong. Um, Stephen Nathan from 10X wrote it. So I emailed Stephen, and he sent me a spreadsheet that made my head hurt. But uh, he, I mean, he, I'll have a look at it this evening. But we look at 1%, and you think, what's 1% extra cost per year? Every year for 40 years? We understand compound. Cost is compounding money out of our future. So being cost aware is critically important. And I'm going to look at it both from a monthly and a, a, a lump sum perspective, whether you've got 300 bucks a month or whether you've got 10 million rand hiding in the wardrobe. We can manage it either way. In essence, what we're looking at here is the core versus satellite portfolio. Index augmentation is the fancy way of saying it, but uh, satellite and core really, really works much easier. 
your core is your exchange traded funds. Core of stocks in the middle, exchange traded funds that in essence give you market return. Now I'll delve into how we can structure that. We can go straight to Satrix 40. We can get more clever and bring some other products in to give us a bit of security in that space. We can make it lower risk so that we will probably underperform when the market does really well, but we will outperform when the market does really poorly. We can go for high risk so that we likely do better than the market in, in, in good years, but in the bad years, we might then do worse than the market. So there's ways we can blend that. But what we do is we put that core of exchange traded funds in the middle of our portfolio. How much and which ones we'll get to in a moment. But that core is critically important. The biggest risk to your portfolio is not Julius Malema or Greece or anybody else. It's you. It's me. Not me to your portfolio, you to yours and me to mine. Doing something stupid. We're human beings. Doing something stupid is about what we do best. We, we yeah, and it, it's human nature. And it, an example, and if the person who sent me the email is in the audience this evening, I'm sorry for using your story, but it's a great example. Uh, bought a share, and I forget what the share was for long-term portfolio. It goes up 40% in three months. And the response is, I'm worried about it falling. Should I sell? You bought this share to hold it for decades. It goes up 40%, and now you want to sell it. It's human nature. Greed. Now you've made the money. You're terrified of losing it. You would actually ironically be happier if it had gone up 4% in four months. The fact that you did very well and had done 40% in four months, your greed becomes fear. The easiest way to absolve yourself or remove yourself from the fear is turn off all the noise. TVs, yeah, I, I always say I've got a TV in my office for three reasons. I watch the sharks, ah, not much lately. I know, it's tough being a Durban boy. Hey, look, at least it's Durban. Huh? You know, for this 14 degree stuff, we don't see that ever. Formula One and five day cricket. Well, that's what I've got a TV for. Uh, the, 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 the TV shows and the print, and I appreciate it. <clears throat> I'm part of the problem, and I'm also part of the exception. If I'm on TV, leave the TV on, phone your friends, everyone gather around and watch. The rest of the time, someone turn it off. The market is flinging information at us, and what is that information going to do? If anything, it's going to make us do a rash, knee-jerk response. I, I knew a gentleman once in, in, in Cape Town. I, I suspect he's passed away because when I knew him, he was in his 90s, and I, I haven't seen him in six or so years. He had a long-term portfolio, and on the 2nd of January every year, because, of course, in Cape Town, 2nd of January is also a holiday, 2nd of January every year, he would spend 20 minutes looking at the portfolio. The next morning at half past nine, he would phone his brokers, sell some shares, buy some shares, come back in a year. That was it. He'd been doing it for 50 years. Yeah. Called lazy investing. That's me. I'm from Durban. We are lazy. So you want those core stocks in the middle, and then you want your satellite stocks. Probably somewhere between maybe 6 to 10 at most. Your satellite stocks are what I call the death to us part. And, and full disclaimer, those stocks are all there because those happen to be my satellite stocks. I mean, and, and there are some others who will come to my portfolio in a bit. But you want, and, and you know, what, what would comprise, what would make a, a stock a satellite stock? You want stocks that are dominant in their sectors. Stocks that are, 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 are streaks ahead. And, and, and there immediately we can see some exceptions here, but let's touch on those that are dominant. I mean, for example, Chopra, fundamentally dominant, decimated pick and pay, just took pick and pay to the cleaners, wrung them out, threw them in the corner, and then for the heck of it, rode over them a second time as they reversed out of the parking lot. Dominant. Will they lose their dominance? Will pick and pay one day upsurp Chopra? I have no idea. I don't pretend to see the future. I can tell you right now, ShopRite is winning. And I don't care what the share price is doing. The share price is not my focus. My focus is buy the winner. ShopRite is better at selling baked beans than anybody else on this continent. Perhaps this planet. The point is, buy them when they're cheap. You don't want to buy them when they're expensive. Right now, ShopRite is crazy expensive. If ShopRite gets to about 100, and 100 bucks, 100 bucks, now we're talking cheap. Will ShopRite get to 100 bucks? Sure. Something else might happen. Earnings will increase, and in three years' time, instead of 100, I want 150. The point being is that your opportunity to buy stocks like ShopRite probably only crop up every couple of years. And usually when they crop up is when there is blood in the streets and fear in the trading floors. October 2008, March 2009. That's when those opportunities arose. Woolies. 
think I bought Willie's at 12 bucks. Uh, yeah, everything. I mean, the only stock, oddly enough, in 2008, the only stock in the top 40 that wasn't red was ShopRite. It went up 12 cents for the entire year. But hey, that was green. Every other of the 39 stocks was, was, was fundamentally red during that period. You want the out-and-out -out winners. You want the stocks that have got edges. You want the stocks that have got moats. Touch on City Lodge. Are there, you know, people will say, oh, what about Grand Parade? And they're like, yeah, yeah, but Grand Parade's selling burgers. I mean, nice, but they're importing their chips. That can't be cheap. But more than that, they've got gaming assets. Gaming assets are, uh, I mean, I, I don't have a... I mean, I, I do. I mean, I don't. I don't think gambling should be illegal, but I do think that as a, as a method of making money, you're asking for trouble because the government is going to look at that and say, "Yeah, is tax." I mean, you, you think smokers and drinkers get hit, gamblers even more so, because government just says, "You know what? Yerks just fudge it so that somehow for every buck that comes in, you only pay out 98. You keep two cents, and we want one of the two." And then there's a whole bunch of other issues. So there are other ones there. What I like with City Lodge is they operate in three different levels. They've got their roads. They've got, I can't remember what they are these days. They've got the three, the, the very cheap, the slightly cheap, and the only cheap. Results are today, occupancy level 62%. That's a very disappointing occupancy level. But as they start to push that level higher, pretty much the money drops to bottom line. Because your hotel, the cost of a hotel is pretty much fixed. This building we're in this evening, they've got 50 staff. If there are five people staying or 100 people staying, they've got 50 staff. The geezers are all on, et cetera, et cetera. So your cost base is fairly fixed. So you get nice ability to it. And the point being, with tourism, with business activity, City Lodge benefits from there. And so we go on. I mean, the Sassel one is easy. What does Sassel do? They take oil and gas. Sorry, they take coal and gas, the most plentiful things in the world after carbon, and they turn it into oil, the most valuable thing that we know as human beings. Forget gold and platinum, this planet runs on oil. Will we one day be driving uh, what they call green cars, cars that run on water? Somebody will, probably not us, and then Sassel probably won't be a good bet. Buying the winners, buying a few of them, buying them when they're cheap. I'm going to come back to all of that, so let's stick with that core part. So your core of the portfolio, exchange traded funds, ETFs. The question then is how much of that portfolio should be in ETFs? Conventional wisdom says somewhere between 50 and 100%. 100 is max low. Look, if you want really, really low risk, money under the mattress. Your risk there is the house burns down or the kids find it. If you're going to be in the equity market, your low risk is 100% ETF. You just buy the exchange traded funds. I'll touch on which in a moment. But otherwise, you somewhere between 50 and 90. 50% is fairly high risk, 95% is fairly low risk. So that would be your core. If you've got 100,000, you put somewhere between 50 and 95,000 into the ETFs. My portfolio runs at about 44%, um, which means I'm running at very, very high risk. But that's just sort of always the level I've, I've sat at. Um, and I can run at high risk because I have no dependence or any worries like that. And I'm young. That's right. I always forget the young part. <laughs> Where you fit in that is a personal decision, of course. And the point with, particularly here, with dropping to 50% and saying I'm going high risk, understand what that risk you've bought on. The risk is not just those individual companies I talk about. That risk is your ability to select the companies, your ability to buy them when the price is attractive, and your ability to withstand the end of the world as we saw in 2008, 2009. The easiest way, you know, my niece and nephew, respectively five and three years old, I don't buy them presents, I buy them exchange traded funds for birthdays and Christmas and Easter and all of that sort of thing. And the point with that is that because that is the absolute low risk. I don't want to take risk for them. This is their, their future. If, if, if I work this well, they'll have a better life for it. So I'm taking, in essence, only market risk. So they are 100% in exchange traded funds. And my sister says to me, ah, oh, but hold on, you're the expert, you're on TV, and, and they, you know, they're only five and three years old. Why don't you buy them some shares? And the answer is quite simple. But why? 
I can buy them some shares and we can do better than perhaps the market over the next 20 years. The point is, over the next 20 years, the market is going to give you a brilliant return. It's going to be the best investment. I've got data 1960 to date. And any 20-year period from 1960 onwards, the best performing asset class is the stock market. Short-term, different asset classes have their day in the sun. Sometimes it's gold, sometimes it's property. Heck, sometimes it's money in the bank. 2008, best place to put your money? In the bank. You earn 15% interest. But the long term, it's just equity. So I say for my niece and nephew, yeah, I can try and get clever and I can do fancy portfolios, but you know what? Just buying an ETF, BBET40, is plenty clever enough. And it's going to give them Great return. And they don't get the money when they're 20 anyway. They, they can't get it when they're 20 because, I mean, they're 20. They'll spend it on sex, drugs, and rock and roll. They can't get it when they're 30 because <clears throat> someone will marry them for their money, which is always my advice. <laughs> no, the easiest way to get rich in a hurry, in fact, not the easiest, the only way to get rich in a hurry, marry money. So someone will marry my niece and nephew on my advice. So they can't have it when they're 30. They can't have it when they're 40. They'll have mid raft crisis and buy Lamborghinis and Ferraris. They get it when they're 50. They'll hate me until they're 50, but when they're 50, it'll be a giant pile of cash. So somewhere between 50 and 95% <clears throat> goes into the ETF space. And in fact, I'm going to say somewhere between 50 and 100% goes into the ETF space. It gives you market return. It gives you security. And when I say security, that doesn't mean markets can't collapse, but over the long term, it gives you outperformance and it gives you security in that you've removed the biggest risk to your portfolio, and that is the individual. That is the greed and fear which drives us as human beings. So it takes that out of the equation. And we start with this part of the portfolio right up front. That's where we start with that core, that ETF part. Monthly debit, lump sums, I'm going to delve into that in a moment. Now, as I said, easy to start a portfolio if you've got large amounts of money. Uh, I've got some slides coming up in a moment. You decide where you are on the risk quote, and you start dropping money in. It takes you about 10 or 15 minutes if you've got an online broker. Boom, money deployed. Harder with small money. So size does matter. And uh, running some examples here. So what do you do? You start by buying the ETFs. You start by putting the ETFs into the portfolio. Because the ETFs are your core, the ETFs are your lower risk because they're purely market, notwithstanding, obviously, the risks inherent within the market. And as you hit certain benchmarks, and I usually say when your ETF portfolio is benchmarked, then you can go and add a satellite to it. Maybe, in fact, you want to say, well, wait until I get to 20,000 with the ETF, then go and buy a 10,000 satellite. Those numbers are going to depend where you want to be in that 50 to 95% equation. Costs are critically important. And a couple of important points here. Firstly, with the ETF, where can you buy it? You can buy it via any stockbroker in the country. You can also go direct to the ETF issuer, Satrix, Deutsche Bank, ABSA, RMB, um, missing a dozen of them, uh, the Prefix guys, et cetera, et cetera. You can buy them direct. You can also get them from Mike Brown's uh, outfit, ETFSA, no relation. Lots of Browns in South Africa. Mike Brown, ETFSA.co.za. And what buying that route does is enables you to do small transactions at low costs. The trick you go to a stockbroker and you do a transaction there, if you do a, a 5,000 Rand transaction at a stockbroker, it'll cost you about 3%. You do a 10,000 Rand transaction, it's going to cost you about 1%. That's not insignificant, and that depends on your stockbrokers. Some brokers are going to charge you even higher amounts. 10,000 Rand transaction might cost you 2, 2.5%. We look at 2 or 2.5% and we say, ah, not too bad. Okay, sure. But that money is therefore sitting in somebody else's retirement, not yours. That's the critical point. Try and keep it in yours. You go direct to the ETF, guys. You pay 0.1% and 3 Rand 50. You don't find cheaper transactions. There is a trick, however, you then pay an annual management fee. And that annual management fee can be as high as 1%, depending on the particular product and the platform that you're using. And there's ways you can hack that. I'll tell you the ways to hack it now quick. So what I do is every month I buy ETFs 
via an ETF provider who I won't name just in case. So monthly debit goes off, boom, buy it nice and cheap, pay my 0.1% to my three rand 50 lacquer. And then every six months, they charge me an admin fee. Okay, they're going to charge me 0.8% annualized every six months. I don't like paying fees. So what I do is just before they charge me, and they charge end of June and end of December, I transfer the shares from the ETF provider to my stockbroker because the stockbroker don't charge the annual fee. There is an admin fee at the stockbroker, but I'm already paying it. Now, the trick is it costs me 72 Rand to transfer the shares. I've got to make sure that the cost that they are going to charge me at that six month hit is more than 72 Rand. Now, in my case, they're going to charge me about 114 Rand. So I switch it out and I pay 72. I therefore save 42 Rand. And you're all thinking that's a lot of work for 42 Rand. Here's the secret 42 Rand, it's a bottle of wine. <laughs> Not an award winning bottle of wine. Actually, you can get a petite pinotage for 42 Rand. Ken Forrester, that is an award winning bottle of wine. 42 bucks, free wine. Liking it. The point is, it's 42 Rand every six months for the rest of my life adds up. And the thing is that they're going to charge me 114 Rand now, and in six months' time, they're going to charge me another 114. Plus, I've added more, so they charge me. It's What's happening? Those costs are compounding. Those costs are compounding. So I'm only saving 42 now, but in six months' time, they would charge me 114, but they don't have my shares, so they don't charge me anything. That is two bottles of wine. And the quality of wine just went up as well, you know. So that's the secret. Now, it depends. If, if you're doing smaller amounts, you've got to work out where that number is and when you need. For me, it's every six months. I was chatting with someone in Durban a few weeks ago, and for them, they move every 18 months because they're only buying a small amount of ETS every month. What you've got to keep on doing is managing that portfolio split. And what's going to happen is that portfolio is going to uh, uh, split. Say you want to go with a 50-50, 50% call, 50% satellite. They're going to shift. You put some more money into an ETF, that number goes up. The One of your stocks, you happen to own Coronation, and Coronation goes crazy on you, and suddenly that one goes skew. So as your portfolio becomes more mature, where to put the money becomes an easier decision. The first thing you say, well, <clears throat> excuse me, I want to be 50-50, but I've actually got 45% ETFs because my stocks were done so well. So any new capital goes into the ETFs until you get that number to 50. If the ETFs are suddenly at 55 because you bought, a I don't know, a bad stock instead of coronation, then new capital goes into the, the satellite to then bring that balance back to whatever that balance is that you want. As you're building it, I would err on the side of the ETF. So the ETF is probably running ahead of your target and err on that side rather than the other. The point being is that when you're buying shares individually, your economics of scale starts to kick in at about 5,000 Rand and really only happens at about 10,000 Rand plus per transaction. And for some folks, that's fine. 10,000 Rand, they got that money, not an issue. For other folks, 10,000 Rand, if you had that much money, you wouldn't be here this evening. You'd be out there living at large. So practically, how do we do it? You've got 1,000 Rand a month. You want to have a portfolio that is split 50-50. In other words, 50 core, 50 satellite. What you do is every month you put 500 into the ETF and you save 500. End of the year, you've got 6,000 saved plus any interest the bank has paid you, which probably accounts to only half a bottle of wine. And then you take that 6,000 and you go and buy an individual stock. So you see how you're running it. And you're doing that 500 into an ETF, debit direct to the ETF platform. So you're getting the low-cost transaction. Sure, sure. Fire away. It's a good question. And, I mean, there are a couple of answers. One of them, most strong reason why not to. The reason I wouldn't do it is a couple of points. Firstly, I'm worried that the market might pull back. So instead of having 12 at the end of the year, you've got 10. That's not the end of the world. There's also potentially a tax hit. The tax hit is probably not massively significant. So you can certainly do that. 1,000 a month into the ETF, December, sell 5,000 worth, go buy an individual share. Second year, rinse and repeat. Short answer, no, no reason why not to. If you want to do same example, but you want an 80-20 split, then you just put more into the ETF. Again, you could put it all into the ETF. After two years, you could sell some. 
point is you incrementally build in the portfolio. Now, one of the, when I was at Standard Bank, we did a whole lot of research back in early 2007 on why people don't get involved in the stock market. And one of them was that you had to be rich to be involved in the stock market. And back in the day, that was true. When I tried to open a brokerage account in 1987, the broker said to me, How much? I think he wanted 10,000 Rand. It's like, dude, I'm in matric. I don't know. I got 125 Rand. That's it. He wanted 10. That was a minimum amount you could have to open an account at a stockbroker. And I understand this was all legislated by the JC. Not legislated, but the JC basically said, you know what, don't phone us if you ain't got 10. So back in those days, you needed money. You can now get away with 300 Rand a month into an ETF. You go direct, you do the FICA, nice and easy. So which ETFs? There are... And I'm, I'm using ETFs and ETNs broadly interchangeable. Let's quickly look at the difference. In truth, they are ETPs, exchange traded products. <clears throat> the ETF. An ETF, quite simply, they physically go and buy the shares. They hold them in an SPV, special purpose vehicle. If the company which is managing it collapses, that's no problem because your shares that you have in the ETF are held in a separate vehicle and they, you, they belong to you. You have title ownership over those. So if the manager of the ETF goes bust, there is no stress on your behalf. You have those shares. There will be a legal process and it might take a bit of time, but you don't lose anything. An ETN, exchange traded note, they don't physically have to hold the underlying assets. What they've essentially done is given you a credit note. In other words, they have promised to pay you the profit if there is any. Now, I know that sounds quite dodge. Hang on, they promised me. But understand that this is not a promise that they can walk away from. Excuse me, unless they go bust. If they go into liquidation, if the issuer of your ETN goes bust, you join the queue. The good news, you're not right at the back. You're third from the back. Right at the back is shareholders. Second to the back is preference shareholders. Third to the back will be you. Now, the companies that issue ETNs in South Africa are respectively Deutsche Bank, Standard Bank, and RMB, and ABSA. The question is quite simple. If you're prepared to have a bank account with one of those, you're prepared to have an ETN. If one of those four goes bust, we have bigger problems in our stock portfolio. We are queuing to get into Zimbabwe. Hey, one of our big banks just went down. Zimbabwe is suddenly an attractive country. So there is a distinction. I, I'm mixing and matching, although all the ones I'm looking at here right now are ETFs. My preferred ETF at the moment, BBET40. Better, be called, better beta equal weighted top 40. Still a mouthful. It is the Nedbank ETF. What it does is it tracks the top 40 index. One difference. The top 40 index is market cap weighted. So, for example, in that index, Billiton is 14%. Shop, uh, not ShopRite, Woolies is 0.6%. What the equal weighted does is it says, no, no, all 40 stocks, 2.5%. So it reduces Billiton down, pushes shop, uh, Woolies up. What it effectively does is reduce single stock concentration. You find in the top 40, the top six shares are about 50 or 60% of that index. Those top six shares are British American Tobacco, uh, BHP Bulletin, MTN, uh, Kumba Iron Ore, Richmond, Naspas probably as well. So what you've done is you've reduced your exposure to the really, really big guys, increased your exposure to the really, really small guys. The back testing by Narina Fisser, who heads up Beta Beta, shows over the longer term an outperformance over the market of about 2%. More importantly, less volatility. Most of your outperformance, I suspect, will come when the market crashes. That will crash more slowly. It will still crash. It will just kind of happen in slow motion, and it will probably go less far down. No, it's not massively popular. I think the biggest holding in it is probably be my three-year-old niece. Um, <laughs> liquidity in ETFs is not a problem because the market maker provides liquidity. So if you buy an ETF, and if you, if you buy it through a platform, Nedbank or ETFSA or one of those, no issues whatsoever. If you buy it via a stockbroker, if you look at the buy and sell, you'll always see the market maker, the issuer. 
buying and selling with quantity either side. So we can always get in and out. If you've got serious quantity, because typically they're on the market maybe 25 or 50,000. If you want to go and buy a million of them, uh, then phone the issuer first, and they will make the market for you and do the deal for you. So that is my, my, my core within my portfolio. That is my preferred ETF right now. I have, I have dozens of ETFs because they were great. And I started buying my first one back in 2000, November, when they listed Satrix 40. And every time a new one came out, I fell in love with it. So I bought it. So I bought Raffi and I bought this one and that one. And, and then finally I got smart and realized, actually, hang on a second. I own like more ETFs than I know what to do with. Um, and and I'm, I'm not consolidating down for, for a fairly simple reason, and in truth, it's a bit of a bad reason, tax it. Now, I've got the, I've got the wrong property ETF, but the thing's up 300% since I bought it. I bought it way back, 2007 or whatever. It's up 300%, I'll be in a sec. Up 300%. I sell it. SARS is going to come and rub their hands in glee. I don't mind paying SARS, but <clears throat> I want to pay as little as possible. I will stress that tax avoidance is a terrible reason not to transact. I mean, there, there, there's two reasons for it. <clears throat> One reason is understand they're getting their fair value from the 40 shares that make it up. So they get the buy and sell price of those 40 shares. So you've got 40 spreads that they're crossing in the whole big matrix. And then on top of that, they add profit. They call it something else. We call it profit. Um, so that's why you'll see wider spreads. Uh, can you, I mean, can you phone them and negotiate spreads? Uh, it, it depends if Nirina's in a good mood that day, um, and it depends on, on the quantity you're trying to trade. But the spread is, 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 it doesn't stress me. Would I like it to go away? Yes. But it don't. It's another cost, but I understand it's a one-off cost. You pay it when you buy. It's not an annual fee that comes back every time you turn around someone's taking more costs. What you will see is that in some of the spaces, for example, let's take Satrix 40. Firstly, very popular ETF, so you get a lot of people within the market maker spread, so you can get better price. But we also now have three Satrix 40s. We've got Satrix 40, we've got RMB BIPs 40, and we've got a standard 40. Correct, Amanda. They're starting to compete with each other. Now, we don't have that in the beta beta. The beta beta, so that is my, my default ETF these days. My, and within the core, and these numbers I'm looking at your core, you probably want that to be the bulk, unless you want a very low risk core portfolio. Probably somewhere between 50 and 100. Your, prop, your PTX 10 is a, is a prop tracks 10. They're two property ETFs. In fact, they're now three because Stan has issued one. The one just tracks the property index, 20 shares again by market cap. So really, what are you doing? You're buying growth point. Whereas the prop tax 10 takes the 10 biggest stocks, property stocks, and does them equal weight. Again, hence my preference. Why do you like property? It's a different asset class, and it's a high yielding asset class. Nice, well, nice interest, not dividend. It pays interest. It's a tax implication, but it pays a good interest flow in that space there. Your RMB mid cap, that's some spice if you really want spice. It is the stocks number 40 to 100, sorry, 41 to 100 in the market. So it includes the like of Capitec, Able, Coronation. There's some great stocks in there, and there's some less great stocks in there. Telcom. Ah, actually, hold on. Telcom's a great stock the last couple of weeks. Price went up. You want some international flavor to it as well? My two preferred in the international space, DBX US, DBX EU. Now, there's also a DBX World. I'm not so, uh, I don't like the world one. It's 6,000 shares. It's just, you know, 6,000 shares. Man, they never get, it, it's, it's got no, no, no outperform. The DBX EU tracks the Dow Jones Euro top stocks, 50, 50 biggest stocks in the, U, in the EU. And what it does is it also gives you uh, RAND, RAND uh, currency hedge. Because they take your RANDs, they turn it into Euros, they buy the shares. RAND weakens your benefit. Sorry? Nope. 
that's the beauty of it. You do it in RANS, in the JC, in South Africa. It's not part of your offshore allowance. There is no paperwork. You just click, click. The US one tracks the MCSI US 600 index, which is broadly a mimic of, of uh, 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 the S&P 500. You always want international exposure. In truth, you get a heck lot of international exposure out of your BBET 4.0. What are the big stocks there? British American Tobacco. How much of their money is in South Africa? I mean, maybe 10 or 15%. SAB Miller makes about 20% in South Africa. Richmond makes about half a percent of them. I mean, I don't know how many watches can rich politicians buy. Um, so in truth, if we look at our top 40, it is dominated by global stocks. We don't need to rush offshore to get international exposure. And those global stocks, if, if the RAND went to 20 against the dollar, the HP Billiton, Sassel, Richmond, SAB Miller, Old Mutual, all of these stocks would see their share price go crazy on the back of a weak RAND. So we've got international exposure there, just more oblique. That is your more direct. Others to throw into the pot is the RMB INF. It is a government CPI linked government bond. So that is really your protection. It's going to give you a wee bit of, of interest payment out. Most importantly, when the market collapses, the bonds typically don't collapse. They're counter-cyclical. People are writing frank, fr fr frantically. You're welcome to. The presentation will also be on the JSC website and Just One Lap. Alternatively, mail me and I'll send it to you. I'm Simon at JustOneLap.com. Prefix, preference shares, similar to the uh, uh, bonds in that they are, they are uh, uh, debt instruments, just that they are debt instruments from listed companies rather than governments. Therefore, they give you a slightly higher yield because companies are more risky than governments. I mean, if Greece managed to not default, we can almost say that government debt is dodgy but fairly unrisky. And then your NGPLT, which is your platinum ETF. Again, at that point there, your platinum as well as your those your RMBs and your, your internationals are really adding your spice to it. Those two, your RMB, INF, and your prefix are really adding safety to it. So if you want low risk, you add a lot more RMB and prefix. If you want high risk, throw more platinum, throw more mid-cap and the like into it. You could pick any commodity in there. We've got coal, we've got Wheat, we have got, in fact, we've got the Standard Bank Africa Equity Index, sorry, uh, Commodity Index, which tracks the basket of commodities um, from the African continent. We have got, uh, obviously, gold ones. We've got palladium. We've got silver. I just, platinum is my, my pick. Oil, I get via Sassel, my exposure to oil. Uh, coal, yeah, the coal story, I mean, I kind of get that in my Xara. I'm not overly, and those exist, obviously, within my Beta Beta uh, BBET 4.0. Gold, yeah, I, I don't buy the gold story. Platinum has real use. Yes, sir. Good question. No, there isn't. There are two, I lie, there are three African ETFs. Guys, there's some seats down in the front here, but you're welcome to stand there if you're comfortable. Um, there are three African funds. There is a Standard Bank. SBAEI, Standard Bank Africa Equity Index, important point with it, it is Africa excluding South Africa. There's a Deutsche Bank Africa, that is Africa including South Africa, and in truth it's really Nigeria, Kenya, and South Africa. Those three make up 90%. And then there's the Standard Bank Africa Commodity Index, which tracks eight or nine commodities, uh, gold, oil, oddly enough aluminium, uh, maize, I think, is one of them, and a couple of the other commodities out. You, there are, I mean, the point is there are now approximately 70 ETFs and ETNs, and, and the blend is almost limitless in a sense, in terms of what you can put into that portfolio. That's ultimately where I would look at that as being a high-risk core portfolio. You're dominated by straight equity with your BBET 4.0 at 50% of it. 12 and a half into property in your RMB mid. Your RMB mid is in essence uh, equity, but slightly higher risk than that. Some international exposure, some platinum, and then some, some interest. I'm still putting a really, really boring bond one in there because when the world is collapsing, you want some ray of light in your portfolio. When everything is red, at least you want something that is a, probably not green, but flat. Yes, sir. 
Uh, good question, because there are actually only two. There are ETS, there's the ZGovi, which is the a basket of government, it tracks the government bond index. Um, and this is the inf in, in inflation linked one. My, my, my logic is, is quite simple, is that I, I'm not bearish on inflation. I'm not thinking that we're going to massive inflationary levels. But what that does say to me is I'm going to get a return ahead of inflation. Because what they do is they give you about 2.75% plus CPI. There's a, as I said, there is a ZGovi one as well. Small nuance. The ZGovi does not pay distribution. It increases the value of the unit. So you won't get cash coming out of it. That's good or bad, depending whether you want cash or not. This portfolio, as it stands, is not geared for cash generation. My international exposure at 10% of the entire is relatively small, although, as I say, you get a lot of that in the BBET 4.0. And you're starting to pick up within that prop tracks, tri, prop tracks 10. You've certainly got growth point. You've got good exposure into Australia. I think you've also got redefine um, and um, either Intuit or cap, Capital Counties. I, can, I get confused as to which is which. That certainly is English property as well. And in fact, I think Nepi's in there as well, new European property, which is uh, Romania. Romania? Bulgaria? Romania. Sorry? All of those countries. Yeah, Eastern Europe part of the world. That's for a core. And again, if you've got a pile of money, easy to do. If you haven't, build it slowly. Start at the top, work your way down. Now, once you've got a chunk of those, then switch a debit to that one, then a debit to there, and slowly. And if you go to a platform like ETFSA, it's easy to switch. You spend a year buying the BBET40, then you phone them up and you say, right, buy me some, some mid caps. And then after a while, you switch to the next one, and slowly you build that distribution up. As I said, that's high risk. You want to reduce the risk in it. What you do is you start pushing your RMB INF significantly higher. You add prefix into it at the same time. Equity is always your, your, your risk asset class, particularly, and, and by risk, the point is in terms of time. The less time you have, the more risk you, you, the less risk you want to be taking in that space. So then we go to the satellite. We've got the core, nice and simple. We go to satellite, which is those around it. There are an infinite different number of ways of deciding how you're going to do it. What is your strategy? Are you going to look for growth stocks? Are you worried about value? Maybe you want income stocks. What about small and mid caps? My, my default is more around value. I'm not a value investor in the mold of, of, of Adrian Seville or Pete Furun. Not at all. I, I, or, you know, Sepo Madiba or... Warren Buffett, although Warren Buffett's no longer a value investor either, really. But I'm a value investor in the sense that I look for quality. When it's cheap, I buy it. And when it's not cheap, I'm happy to watch cash build up in my portfolio. Currently, I've got cash building up in my portfolio because I'm not seeing a heck lot of value out there. I'm not seeing the stocks that I'm attracted to, frankly, just not very cheap. So I let the cash build up. And at some point, I'm going to panic. I'm going to buy something. I might go buy some taste holdings. I might go buy some more ETFs. Cash makes me itchy. I might go and buy a wine farm, and that would be a terrible idea. Yes, sir. It's not going down. I think it's going up, but I think it's also expensive. I'll, I'll show you in a moment how I get too cheap, what my definitions of cheap are. And you must understand I'm not a CA. I'm not an accountant. My background is film and video, so my methodologies are fairly simple. If you've got more complicated methodologies, then brilliant. Run with the more complicated. So what are you doing? Be selective. Don't try and buy everything. You want probably at a maximum 12 shares, probably at a minimum around eight within your satellite portfolio whether that be 5 or 50%, whatever number that you have ultimately settled on. You want to buy at the right price. You want them when they are cheap. You know, one of your biggest determinants of how much money you're going to make in an investment is the price you pay. If you pay 200 Rand for ShopRite, will you make profit? Yes. In the long term, you will make profit from that investment. But your profit is going to be hampered by the fact that you paid 100, 200. If you paid 160, you can immediately see you make more profit. That price that you pay up front is one of the biggest determinants. The lower the price, the higher the dividend yield. The lower the price, the more you bang for your buck you get. So it's not about saying, right now, would I buy a shop right? No, I'm not saying it's not a brilliant company. I'm saying it's an expensive company. 
I like to buy my stuff cheap. I like to buy it when there's a fire sale. The problem when there's a fire sale is we tend to panic. Well, and, and we panic for good reason. Because everybody out there, I mean, if you go back to 2008, 2009, panic was easy because everyone was panicking. You know, when, 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 when SABC3 News is leading their headline news of the evening with market collapsing, that's probably a good time to be a buyer. Because now there is panic. There is out and out panic. You want to do what the herd is not doing. What did we see in the last set of numbers from the collective investment industry? The biggest inflow of money into the collective investments unit trusts has happened in the last six months. What does the average individual out there do? Invest at the top, disinvest at the bottom. And we see it every time. Because why? Because when does the, when does the media start saying positive things about the market? At the top. We had a high yesterday. So suddenly in the front page of the Natal Mercury, market at new high. My sister phones me, all excited. Market's at a high, shall we buy some shares? It's like, no, don't be crazy. You buy the shares when it says market at a low. She's like, oh, no, okay. You see what it is. I mean, of course the media loves the high. We as investors, we love them when we're in. But we also love blood in the street because that gives us opportunity. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. yeah, so what do I do with the cash while I'm waiting to buy? And, and that stresses me. So I desperately try and find things to buy. And I've been, I've been picking Keith McLaughlin's brain a whole lot lately. He's a small and mid-cap expert, and he's given me some ideas. I'll touch on them in a moment. Um, I try and put into other shares that I think are cheap. But the companies I like are coming up with results at the moment, and none of them are turning them into cheap. Because a stock changes its rating by one or two ways, price moves or profit moves. If profit moves enough, it can make it cheap. If I can't find and eventually I get itchy, I just put it into an ETF. Just pick an ETF. I'm happy to buy ETFs at any point in the market. I would like to time it, but I'm not going to get that right now. I'll buy ETFs whenever they are. Buy winning stocks. Winning sectors, winning stocks. In 10 years' time, are we going to look back at the platinum stocks and say, man, they were cheap? Maybe. But maybe the platinum stock you bought isn't around in 10 years. First, I want platinum as a sector to start winning. Then I will find a particular winning stock. Is there? And the point is not to say that you can't be high risk and go and buy a, a high risk platinum stock and you'll make a fortune. Of course, you could. Truth is, you could also go buy a high risk platinum stock and lose a fortune. There's just too, simply too much uncertainty out there. And to the answer, the question, how low can a stock go? The answer is really, really simple. Zero. That's how low a stock can go. Well, actually, it goes to one cent and then no more lower. Until eventually it goes into liquidation. For me, it's risk-reward adjusted. I looked, I had a long, hard look at platinum, I walked away. Construction. Okay, let's be honest. Let's step back. I went bullish in construction three and a half years ago. Bought whole lots of construction stocks and then sold them about a year and a half ago at break even. But let's be honest, it's not break even because if I put the money in the bank, I would have earned 6% a year, I would have made 12%. I wasn't, the fact that I bought them at this and sold them at that, I'm not a break even. I've got costs and I've got opportunity cost. Will construction be a great investment again? Ah, yes. Key point about my satellite portfolio, your note, they're not very cyclical. What's a cyclical stock? Like construction. Construction goes crazy. We've got World Cup, we've got power trains, we've got things. Construction companies are right up at the moon. Then the world ends and the power train floods and the soccer World Cup moves on. And construction stocks are right in the doldrums, doing rights issues, which cost you money. I don't like cyclical. I will trade cyclical. And I will do a trade that can run for years and years and years. But in a long-term portfolio, I don't want cyclical stocks. That's why I'll be with you in a sec. It's why I largely don't like single commodity stocks. One exception, Sasol. I think oil is different. Yes, sir. <laughs> Look, Alan, the types of Alan Gray's, and you'll see it as well with the... Uh, uh, um, RECM, Pete Fulham's business, are classic value investors. They want to go, they go and find the beaten down depressed. But I understand that their strategy is to try and buy low, so high. My strategy is to try and buy. 
this hole, just buy. And if you if you owned my own Roberts, you bought it in 2004, six rand, you watched it go to 128 rand, and if you take the rights issue into account, it's back at 10. Will it get back to 120? Probably, but in the meantime, you're not even getting dividends out of them, and you're having to pay in for rights issue. Yes, sir. I mean, some of the guys, Group 5's got a, uh, and they were doing well until their, their, their trading update. They've got some decent uh, Australian exposure. The, the construction guys who are doing better at the moment are those with Australian exposure. There are two problems with, with construction. One, the order books. The order books, we all salivate, we get excited. You know, order books, I suspect that they are a mess. I, I, my assistant was going and crunching the data. What I'm saying is, they tell me they've got a 40 billion order book. Is that a meaningful number? Can I use that to extrapolate anything? The early evidence, no. And secondly, I think that the margins that they enjoyed, they're never going to see again. And the big guys are going to get sued. If you are a municipality, Cape Town, built a stadium, and you've just learned that you spent $4 billion and, and, and it should have been 3 and a half, you know what you're going to do? You're going to go to the construction company and you're going to say, I would like my half billion back, please. Because the Competition Com Commission fines do not absolve them from litigation. And if I were a municipality, I would like my half billion. So I'm going to show you some of my stocks, a couple of important points. I call these fundamental charts. I'm not going to delve into how I make them because that is a half hour story on its own. If you go to that link there, I know it looks weird. It is. It's called a short link. My IT guys like question marks and stuff like that. I got a video there about 15 or 20 minutes which explains exactly how I make these charts. A couple of important points. These are data points at financial year ends. These are not live in that sense. I'll touch on that nuance in a moment. I thought I had another, ah, there's the one I'm looking for. So I, I identify the company. I say to myself, I, I, I give it thought and I decide, I mean, what sectors do you want to be? You want to be in food, right? People are going to eat, always going to eat. So what food do you want to be in? Well, you want to be in the safe food and the high-end food. But either way, you want to be in the best food retailer. Best food retailers on the continent, perhaps, in fact, both ShopRite and Woolies have won global awards in the food retail space. They are global leaders. So I identify the stock, and then I use some fairly simple metrics in order to, uh, to decide whether or not to buy them. So I end up with charts that look like that. That is a uh, ShopRite picture. The red line is the price earnings going back to 1993. The blue line is price to net asset value going back to 1993. The respective green lines are the average for the period. I want to buy those below the green line. Simple as that. Now, a couple of points. I've done 20 years of data. Too much. 20 years is too much data. You probably want somewhere between 5 and 10. 7 is probably a good number. Why is 20 too long? Because things can fundamentally change in 20 years. For example, back at that point there, ShopRite was the second best retailer in South Africa. Pick and pay was the best. So there's been a fundamental shift in terms of ShopRite becoming the best again. So that data is actually too long. What I can tell you if I give you shorter data, the average price earnings is 22. I therefore want to buy below that price earnings. And that at current levels, that means the stock below 140 Rand. Now, obviously, when results come out, the earnings will change, and that has an impact on everything. But right now, if tomorrow, if ShopRite sold to 135 Rand tomorrow, all of that cash that I'm sitting on, boom, ShopRite. Would it go lower? Don't care. You know what? I bought a great company at a good price. Now, what's a great price? Well, a great price would be one standard deviation away, which means I need ShopRite at 108 Rand. At 108 Rand, I would sell my niece and nephew. No, that would be illegal, wouldn't it? Uh, I would pawn them. I wouldn't sell them. I would lend them to someone for some cash. So there's ShopRite. Great company. Right now, too expensive. Simple as that. Uh, another one. Sassel. Brilliant company. I think offering value. Now let's make some definitions here. Firstly, 2012. I don't have the 2013 financial years yet. And the price has moved. So that's an old snapshot. Because the price has moved, what has happened to price earnings? Gone higher. If you can get Sassel in a price earnings below 10, buy it. I think it's currently at 10 and a half. I think it's moved quite strongly recently. And that's all I'm doing. Nice and simple stuff like that. I keep these charts. I've got them all on my PC. I update them as the numbers come out. 
the first time you do it, it's a little bit painful, but then it becomes quite easy. MTN, great company. Results out this morning. They were mid-year results, and it pretty much changed nothing. It took the current price earnings. Because understand, this is from December, end of December, their, their financial year end. The prices moved markedly, so the price earnings had gone up. Today's results that came out this morning take that price earnings down to 16. Great company, not cheap. Problem with the market right now. Lots of great companies, not much cheap. City Lodge, great company, but confusing. Something fundamentally weird happened here. I can tell you what it is. It was their BEE scheme. So they did a BEE scheme, and the way they expensed it hurt things, and I'll be perfectly honest, I can't understand what happened. And that's not because, I mean, people have tried to explain it to me, including, and his name's gone out of my head, the CEO. Somebody? Didn't help me. Couldn't understand it. But what, what's happened here is we had a nice chart that was making sense. And then suddenly it just got terribly ugly. And that was the result. And there were other issues behind it. Earnings were hurt because they did the massive build up to the World Cup. We they got the crisis. We didn't get the occupancies, et cetera, et cetera. The, the way we solve this is we go for a shorter time frame because that there is dragging it down. Problem is, City Lodge, results out this afternoon. I had a quick glance at them. Still expensive. Not bad numbers, but still expensive. And I could go through my entire portfolio, and I'll show you to in a second. Point is, every, the only two shares in that portfolio which aren't overpriced right now, Billiton, Sassel. That's it. Billiton and Sassel. And probably because they both come with risk. Small stocks, be selective. Buy the ones that are winning. Don't be a, I mean, taste holdings. I'm now looking at buying taste holdings at probably what, three rand 50, three rand 80. Folks are going to say, but why didn't you buy it at 60 cents? Because at 60 cents, it was massive high risk. The taste holdings has de-risked itself. That process of de-risking itself means that the people who took massive high risk and bought it at under a rand, they have been rewarded. But they took risk. Taste holdings could have hit the wall. I don't want to take that risk. So I will pay three rand fifty or four rand for taste holdings. Calgary M3, I bought it at three rand, not fifty cents. It's currently at six rand. I think it's got ten or fifteen rand written all over it. Not next week, not next month, maybe not even next year. They've got an order book that is eight times their annual revenue at the moment. Adapt IT, Subusha Balala, I think results are out on Monday. I'm expecting them to be good. I don't know how good. They, they small IT in, in, in Durban again. The stock's done incredibly well. What have they done? They've de-risked themselves. When they were Infowave, all they did was do IT services for Elovo. That is massive high risk. And your entire business is picked to one company that grows sugarcane. And you just compounded your risk. Now they're expanding. They're buying other assets. They're trying to be an EOH. That in itself has risk, but nonetheless. Accentuate, a uh, small little company who does flooring. Quality management, quality assets. Of that list, I own Colgro and Taste and Adapter on my shopping list. Um, Taste, uh, sorry, Adapter T. I have an interview with Sabusha Balala on Monday, so I can't buy it because I'm in closed period. And both Taste and Accentuate, I've had one on one since the CEO in the last week, so I can't buy them either um, until at least a two week window thereafter. I don't want the JSC coming after me for dodgy activities. So core ETFs, you hold them. You buy an ETF, you don't sell it. Unless you bought a platinum ETF and one day we discover that we can make catalytic converters out of salt. Well, then you sell your platinum ETF because there's been a fundamental change. But your BBET40, your, 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 your prop tax 10, etc. You buy them, you hold them, you leave them to your heirs. Your satellite portfolios, you ignore the price. You focus on the key reasons. So I bought ShopRite because they are the dominant food retailer in South Africa. They have killed everybody else. They've got their margins up to operating margin of 5.8%. The global average for operating margin of food retailer, 1.6. They are more than three times ahead the global average. Point is, with a number that big, there's only one way to go, down. But it also means when pick and pay comes charging and threatening, ShopRite's got wiggle room. Pick and pay has. 
So I watch the business. I don't care about the reason why I bought it. When I buy the stocks, I write down my reasons, my key reasons why I bought it. And as long as those remain in place, I carry on holding it. If I wake up tomorrow and shop riders decided to sell Ferraris, I sold them in a flash. Because if I wanted a Ferrari dealership, I would have bought one. Important point, when it's time to panic, panic quick. Don't sit and think, just panic. Just form a panic, do it, worry about it later. There is my portfolio, as you see. I mean, there's just too many ETFs. But, so British American Tobacco, BHP Bulletin, Colgrow M3, Capitec, City Lodge, Clover, Famous Brands, MTN, Old Mutual, Sassel, ShopRite, Standard Bank, and Woolies are the equities in it. Understand a lot of those, I manage my wife's portfolio, my mother-in-law's portfolio, my sister's portfolio, my niece and nephew, and those stocks are included in there. But they only own ETFs. They don't have any equity. They just do core portfolios. I'm going to come back to that in a moment. Quick recap, keep it simple. It's a process. This is not an event. This will take time. Warren Buffett is the third richest man in the world, but he's also 80-odd years old. He started when he was 11. No one heard of him before he was in his 60s. This is going to take time. This is not a event. Critical points, decide your risk levels, decide overall strategy, which ETFs and which stocks. Decide the risk level. You are in the equity market. That is risky. Don't go to a risky space. So you're in equities. You're already in the riskiest asset class there is out there. You then go and find a sector that is dead. So you've taken the risk and you've ramped it up higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You don't want risk. You want stratospheric risk. And then you go find a company that is lying unconscious on the side of the road. And you think, yeah, I'm going to buy that. Because imagine if it wakes up and beats Hussein Bolt in the 100 meters. Man, the thing's dead. It's not waking up. Buy the quality. You're in a risky space. When you're in the risky space, buy the brilliant stuff. They carry on winning. We say to ourselves, oh, we don't want to buy quality. How are we going to make money? Go look at the qualities. Go look at the Aspens. Go look at the, the shop rights, the MTNs, the BHP bulletins. Look at what those stock prices have done. These are the boring blue chips. And over decades, they have done hundreds and hundreds of percents. Legal stuff again, in case you missed it the first time. I'm approximately two minutes behind schedule, so I'll take some very quick questions. Yes, sir. Um, no, it, it, this is not a, a massively focused one. Income generation, you would skew yourself towards the prefix. Um, and and I mean, there are high dividend yielding stocks. There are not very many at the moment because of the way the market is run. Vodacom, for example, instead of MTN, Vodacom, which is about a 6% yield as opposed to MTN's about a 3.5. Sorry? No, Cetrix Divi is not a great dividend player. The actual dividend yield is about 2%. So you would have some core, you'd have less. So your core would be more focused towards your income generation, which is your prefix and the like. And if you put any equity on a satellite, you gain, you would go for the dividend focus. So instead of MTN, you take a, 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 a Vodacom, that sort of relationship there. Yes, sir. Yeah, okay, I mean, you're talking about the sharing of information and the like. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the, at the stock brokers, they, they're all going to give you research and everything like that. In terms of the networking, my preference is Twitter because there there's just an infinite universe of people. Yeah, you know, I, 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 I have conversations with Jim Cramer sometimes. Most times he ignores me, I admit, but occasionally he does say, like, go away, you're harassing me. Um, but, you know, the, the, the Twitter, so, I mean, yeah, and I'll, I'll be honest, I like it because it fits with my, my, my sort of ADD type thing. 140 characters is about spot on for me. There are other places, I mean, there, there's, there's share chat, there are chat forums out there. But I just find that Twitter's a much, it's a significantly larger universe. Share chat, I mean, how many people go there? 50. Twitter's 250 million people. Yes, sir. Yes. 
So Abel versus Capitec. I, I look, let's I mean first confess I bought my Capitec tranche at 40 Rand. So I'm so crazy at profit, I'm not stressed. There's some fundamental differences between Capitec Cap and Abel. Um, none the least is Ellerines, which was a terrible disaster and it's going to cost them a fortune. The other is that uh, uh, Capitec is a deposit taker as well, which means they don't have to always loan money. Capitec did two rights issues on the way up. Abel's done a rights issue or is going to do one at the bottom, which is a massive destruction of capital in that sense. My preference has always been Capitec over Abel. Um, it remains right now Capitec over Abel. I am not stressed a, all the unsecured bubbles that are going out there. Can Capitec go lower? Absolutely it can. It's been at 225. It's now 180 or so. It's already down fairly significantly. It might go to 150. It might go to 100 bucks. But let's go forward five years' time. The unsecured bubble will be gone. Capitec is going to be a significant, it's a game changer in the banking industry in South Africa. Their cost to income number is about 38%. The big four banks are at 55 because of their decentralized IT, because they are truly paperless. I never liked the ABLE model, even if they didn't have Ellerings. I always preferred Capitec on it. It's going to take some pain. It absolutely is going to take some pain, um, but I, I'm, I'm happy to ride the pain. Would I buy ABLE right now? No. ABLE will one day be back at 30 or 40 Rand, but I reckon over the next year or two, ABLE is going nowhere. You've got a 4 billion Rand rights issue that's going to be massive dilution, at least wait until after that. They're going to sell Ellerines. They're going to lose about 3 billion in Ellerines. Depending what they say, if they sell it for 2 billion, the market will be a right. If they sell it for 1 billion, the market is going to kill that stock again. And the point is, the pain is only now happening. It's going to be. 6, 12, 18 months before we see positive news out of, out of ABLE, maybe two years. So that share price is doing, it's going to be sub-20 for the next year at least. So there's no rush to buy ABLE. Notwithstanding, I prefer capital. And management. Yes, sir, I'll brief you now. Rafi don't like it, single commodity, the companies, the mine is majority owned by a third party, so they've got no move. move. Xara is an interesting one. Three assets, um, coal predominantly, mineral sands, minority, and then Sish and iron ore. Coal, yes. Coal, future of energy. The, the, the mineral sands, I, I ignore. The, the iron ore is what worries me there. Um, but but I'm, not, I'm, not a favor, I'm not a fan of single commodity stocks. If I was to do a single commodity stock, it would be Xara. Because at least they've got the coal as a kind of underpin. So they've got that, that almost like a core satellite. Coal's their core. Uh, iron ore is their satellite. Yes, sir. Yes. Short answer. Uh, short answer. Unit trusts have got two problems. Costs, significant underperformance. In theory, only half of the unit trust market can beat the market. So it's this half here, before fees. You bring fees into it, 15%, 1-5% of general equity unit trusts beat the market. An ETF is the market. So an ETF is in the top 15% of unit trusts. The point is, we then say, well, pick the winners. And I'm busy crunching the data, but the early suggestion says, you know, whenever a company says, blah, 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 we did so much percent, and they always have the small print, Past performance is no guarantee of future performance. They're actually lying to you. Past performance has got zero, and I mean zero, 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 zero indication of future performance. What your portfolio did last year has zero indication of what your portfolio will do next year. So what do we do? We go by the winner. Does it win? Maybe. And if it doesn't, you're the one who hurts. Yes, sir. Ah, great point. So. In a perfect world, on day one of the portfolio, equal weighting. Then what happens? One of them doubles in value. One of them goes down 10%. The weightings get all type of fluidy and mixy. So the weightings start to go all, all over the place. I get stressed if one of my stocks is starting to hit sort of 15% of that uh, uh, satellite, of, of, of the outer ring of the portfolio. Then I start, because I've got 12 in there. So if a stock's at 15, I start to get stressed. The way I typically manage it is I just stop buying it and I start buying the others. What I will sometimes do, in the case of Capitec, because Capitec went from uh, 40 to 200 in the space of about two years. So it just exploded on me. So I actually sold some Capitecs. I hate doing that. I'm selling winners. It's like the silliest thing in the world. 
but it just it, it became too big a concentrated risk. That's a rare exception. Uh, sometimes my stocks at one time, ShopRite and Woolies were a little overweight. They corrected themselves two ways. Price came down, and I had more money flowing in, which I then allocated elsewhere. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm going to leave it there because I've well run my time. You're welcome to hit me up with more questions. You will find me uh, nowhere because my doofa has broken. Um, uh, the best place to find me is simonbrown.co.za. My email is simon at just one lab or simon pb on Twitter. Uh, I've overrun. Apologies for that. Three quick last points, please. Feedback forms. Leave them with Takalani. Reception will validate your parking. Thank you very much for your time this evening.